Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome, Green Party. I love you guys. Um, I want to introduce Warren. Um, Warren Mosler is an American economist and theorist and one of the leading voices in the field of modern monetary theory, MMT. An entrepreneur and financial professional, Warren Mosler has spent the past 40 years gaining an insider's knowledge of monetary operations. He is the author of The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, which you can download for free. And we're going to send you all a link of a lot of his work, and it's all free online. And welcome, Warren. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. Thank you. So it's my turn? Yeah. Okay. You, yeah, do your Good. presentation. Okay. So what I'm going to do is share my screen. I'm doing this right. Does everybody see that? Yes. Clear. Okay. Now there are only five slides. So the next one is, no, it doesn't want to change on me. So let's see. Why does it want to change? Okay. So uh, let me get rid of this over here. Move this out of my way. Okay. So what I'm going to give you is a base case for purposes of analysis. If you can understand this model, then all your questions uh, should fit in with this model. And everything else you see in the world, is, underneath it all, this is what's going on. So I use example of in the 1800s, when the British wanted to force the domestic populations in Africa to grow coffee and the French did the same thing. Okay. And so how did they do that? Uh, people who were living there already had a life. They were already living a non-monetary existence. The last thing they wanted to do was go down to some British coffee plantation and work. Okay. So what the British did was create a script of currency. I'll call it the crown just for simplicity. And it could be anything, but it's just a script. And they imposed a hut tax on all dwellings payable in that script. And it might be 10 script a month or something like that, 50 script a month. They, they impose a hut tax. And the British Navy was there, the military was there. And if you didn't pay the tax, they'd burn down your hut. So it was enforced and it was enforced with, with violence. Okay. And script could then be earned by working at the coffee plantation. So let's review this. The public purpose behind this, what the British were doing was to grow coffee. They levied a tax. They put a tax liability on everyone's house. That caused lots of people to be looking for work or somehow you know, look for some way to earn script so they could pay the tax so their house wouldn't be burned down. Okay, and people looking for paid work who can't find it because at that point, they couldn't find it because there wasn't any. It's just a tax liability. Nobody has any yet. Those are called unemployed. And so the what the British did was create the hut tax created unemployment, people looking for paid work for the further purpose of the British then being able to hire those people who were wanted to work for script. Uh, and they would then get paid and then they could pay their tax. And if they wanted to earn extras, that was fine. The British didn't particularly care. Anybody who wanted to come down and work for script, they'd pay them. And so some of those script were used to pay tax and the rest were just saved. And they became that became the money supply uh, in that local economy. Okay, so. Now, knowing that, here's the official, if you want to call it that, MMT money story. Now, the mainstream textbooks tell a story about barter and that type of thing. And I'm not saying it happened or it didn't happen, but I don't find that particularly useful for anything. This, this is a money story that I tell and it describes today's currencies and how they work. Okay, number one, the state desires to provision itself. Well, the US government today doesn't wanna grow coffee, but they want people serving in the military, they want public education, they want public health and the justice a legal system that type of thing. They need to provision themselves with mainly labor, but also lots of uh, you know, outside uh, goods and services. So how do they do that? What they do is they impose a tax liability. And if we get into income taxes and other taxes, it gets complicated, but it works exactly the same. 
uh, for purposes of the money story as if it was a property tax, the same way the British imposed a property tax. So I'm gonna assume here a property tax uh, just to, uh, for purposes of the example, to have a base case for analysis. And then we can modify it for other taxes if, if, if you want to. Okay, so the state imposes a tax liability and let's say it's a tax on everybody's house. This tax liability now creates people who are sellers of goods and services now seeking the state's currency, which is the tax credit, the thing needed to pay the tax or else you're gonna lose your house uh, in exchange. So what we've done is that the state's imposition of tax liabilities in the first instance creates unemployment by design. And what I'll state right now is that is the source of all unemployment. It's not robots or anything else, it's tax liabilities. Right. If you think back to Africa, before there were tax liabilities from the British, there was no unemployment. There was nobody looking for paid work. There wasn't a currency. Okay, so uh, you've got to have a tax liability. The currency is a tax credit. The tax liability creates what we define as unemployed people, people looking for paid work. For the further purpose of number four, the state then hires the people that the tax costs to become unemployed. The state buys the goods and services that it desires. Okay, it hires the soldiers, it hires public health workers, public education workers. Okay, and then taxes can be paid and state securities purchased. If, someone, if people earn more than enough to pay their tax, the, those dollars are still sitting in bank accounts. They can be used to purchase treasury securities if they want to. Okay, so let's move on here. That is the money story and that is the core behind MMT. Now, what's new about this? What we have is a sequence, tax liability, unemployed people getting hired, getting paid, and then they're paying their tax. If you look at all the mainstream economic models, they've got the sequence backwards. They see the government getting tax money first so that it can then pay people to work. And that is completely backwards and it's caused their models to not come up with the right answer. So their models don't reflect reality of what's going on. So at the very core of their models, we've picked up a couple of errors. This is a big one. They've got the sequence backwards. Every congressman thinks they have to get dollars by taxing to be able to spend. And what they don't collect in taxing, they have to borrow, okay, to be able to spend. So you had President Obama going to China our bankers to make sure they would buy our bonds so that we had the money to spend on healthcare. You had uh, Paul Ryan talking about uh, with all this debt, we could become the next Greece, not be able to borrow the money we need to spend and therefore be on our knees to the IMF, you know, begging money so that the government could spend. They've all had it backwards. If you look at the last couple of years, that's all gone. Okay, you didn't hear that when we, ran a $5 trillion deficit for COVID. You heard, you didn't hear one word about taxes or how you're gonna pay for it for that initial 5 trillion. They just, they weren't afraid of the government bouncing checks. They were concerned about causing inflation, but that's a major victory for modern monetary theory. We've been saying, look, the government's not gonna bounce checks. It's not gonna run out of money. It's spending first. All the dollars to pay taxes come from the government through its agents. Federal Reserve, the banking system, they're all agents of government. And we have, the government has to spend first before the money is out there to pay taxes or buy bonds. So the idea of running out of money is not applicable. The idea of becoming the next Greece is not applicable. And if you look at that uh, situation in, that the British set up in Africa, they weren't taxing people to get the money to spend. They were taxing them so that they would come down to the plantation to earn the money so that they could you know, get paid and then pay the tax, all right? So sequence is critical. You have to understand sequence to understand it. And it's gotten through to Washington, at least to the extent where all they're concerned about now is whether overspending will cause inflation. They're not concerned about bouncing checks. And so that's a major change from several years ago. And without that change brought about by MMT, uh, largely popularized by Stephanie Kelton and her book, The Deficit Myths, and originally her getting a job uh, at the uh, Senate's uh, budget committee uh, that was headed by Bernie Sanders at the time. That's what started this change in understanding that allowed us to get through COVID without a financial crisis. Okay, 
The other thing MMT adds, or it's really part of the same thing, is we recognize that the currency is a simple public monopoly. When you have a monopoly, you don't have normal markets functioning. All market theory assumes there's no monopoly functioning because if there is, they've got to change it all. And they have to modify it to take account of that monopoly. Well, the currency itself is a monopoly, which means you got to modify everything and take account of the currency being a monopoly before you can do anything else in your analysis of the, the monetary economy. So as I said before, the funds to pay taxes come from the state. The Africans needed the scripts that only came from the British to be able to pay uh, their taxes. Uh, if they could have created the money themselves, they never would have gone to the coffee plantation. Okay, but you can't. The whole thing is coercive and it's forced. And there are strict laws about, you know, against counterfeiting. And there have to be, or it doesn't work. Okay, state spending precedes the payment of taxes and the purchase of state securities. Okay, we just went through that. State spending is limited only by what tax liabilities cause to be offered for sale. So when the British imposed this hut tax, how much could they spend? Well, whoever showed up at the plantation looking for work, they could afford to pay them. Maybe the total tax was a thousand script and a thousand crown and the people showed up and earned 1,500. The British can afford to pay them. They're not limited by how much they're going to pay in taxes later. That doesn't make any sense. So once you understand it, you can see why the money that's uh, paid in taxes is not some kind of a um, limit on the amount government can spend. The amount of things that are for sale is a limit. If nobody had showed up to the plantation looking for work, the British couldn't have spent anything. If nothing is offered for sale in exchange for US dollars, the federal government can't spend anything. Okay, so their limit is what is offered for sale. Taxes create things to be offered for sale. It creates an environment where things are offered for sale. Okay, so tax liabilities are the cause of unemployment. There isn't any other. I've asked Marxian economists, did Marx understand the cause of unemployment? They said, no, you are correct. It's tax liabilities, it's something he missed. So we've made a contribution to, uh, to Marx's theories as well, okay? And this last one, which is a little uh, bit obscure, but if you think about it, it's not so obscure. What the price level is a function of prices paid by the state when it spends. What does that mean? What is the value of a script, one unit of the script, or let's say a crown, they called it the crown in Africa? Well, if people showed up to work and they paid one crown a day, that's enough to establish value when they take those things back home. Because somebody else who wanted to pick berries and didn't want to go work in the coffee plantations, you know, he has to get, yes, he still needs crown or he's going to get his house burned down. And so there'll be an exchange between people who go to work to earn extra who don't want to pick berries because there's thorns and they don't want to get their skin cut or whatever. And it's out in the hot sun and whatever. There's just, you know, I'm not saying that picking coffee is either, easy either, but there'll be some sense of, you know, maybe one day's work is worth one bushel of berries or however many you can collect. So if you get paid one crown for working one day in the coffee plantation, the guy picking berries that takes all day, his one bushel would be worth, you know, he'd be worth one crown approximately. The market will sort that out. There's a, what they call a double coincidence of wants. And that's called relative value. So once you know it takes one day to earn a crown in the coffee plantation, now you know what everything else is worth. Maybe a day's work of babysitting is only worth half a crown because that's a pretty easy job. Okay, and uh, but that's people work that out. Now, if the government decided to pay two crown a day instead of one, now you only have to work half a day to earn a crown. So a crown's only gonna buy half a bushel of berries, okay? The only information on absolute value, what a crown is worth uh, that goes gets into the marketplace comes from the British setting that price. The market can't do that because it's a monopoly. And they teach you in Economics 101, when they teach monopoly the first day, monopolists are price setters. And there's no dispute in mainstream economics about this. They all agree that uh, when there isn't any competition, when there isn't a market, when you've got the stuff and somebody else absolutely needs it, you set the price. It's not a competition or barter or anything else. You have absolute power to set the price, depending on how bad they need it. Okay, now if they don't care if their house gets burned down, then you can't set any price. But if they care about their house getting burned down, you can set the price. 
So the way that translates into economic talk is that the price level is a function of, that means it depends on prices paid by the state when it spends. And that is true today as a point of logic. There's no way around it. And none of the people who talk about inflation have yet incorporated that into their discussion of where prices come from. But the mainstream's taken note of it and it's starting to work its way into their models because they didn't have a theory of where prices came from. It had occurred to them that the currency is itself is a monopoly, in which case they would immediately recognize it as price setter and they're beginning to do that. Okay, so a little diagram. We've got the government at top, which could be the British. It's the thing with the taxing authority or it's agents that have taxing authority, okay? There's the economy down there. And you say what's flowing up to the government are goods and services. What's flowing down to the economy are US dollars. That's the sequence. The next sequence is they pay taxes and those might as well be thrown into the garbage because it's not, it doesn't have any value to the government. They just want the goods and services, uh, which they get because you have a tax liability, you need their money, you go to work for it, they pay you. They could trust you to throw it in the garbage instead of paying it to them, fine, but they can't trust you. Or at least they can't trust me, they can probably trust all of you. And, uh, and so they collect taxes, but they don't have any use for them. And if you actually pay your taxes in actual cash, uh, you know, if, if you're a waiter and you've earned a few thousand dollars in tips and you've got it in uh, old $20 bills and you pay your taxes with it, the government will give you a receipt, say, thank you very much. And then they'll send it off to the, to the shredder and somebody will, will shred the money. You can buy bags of shredded money in Washington. Now, nobody else does that except the government. If you pay me with old 20s, I don't send it to the shredder, but the government does. Okay, it's in a very different position. Now, over at the Fed, what's going on there? The government spends more money than gets used to pay taxes. That's called the government deficit. They might spend you know, 8 trillion and only 4 trillion gets used to pay taxes. The other 4 trillion, where is it? Well, it's in the economy and it's being held at the Fed for people in the economy in three forms, cash, reserves, and securities. The Fed can change the mix of all those, but they don't change the total. The total is the difference between the, the dollars the government spent and how many were used to pay taxes, okay? And all the dollars that the government has spent that haven't been used to pay taxes sit in that little warehouse called the Fed. And that is, it's not wrong to call that the money supply in the economy, the net money supply in the economy. And that's the money supply that supports all the business activity in the economy, all the cash in your pocket, all the reserves for insurance companies and savings and pension funds. Uh, that's where all the net uh, financial assets in the economy are as savings. Okay, and that's a little model that's exactly the same as what I showed you with the British. The British tax the, the economy, people, goods and services flowed to the plantation, people went there to work, they were paid. Uh, they then paid taxes, which the British had, if, if the script was old and dirty, they'd throw it away, otherwise they might use it again, it doesn't matter. They had a big box of those things. They, don't cost them anything. And the rest were, they didn't have a Federal Reserve. They just had you know, pockets to save their money or maybe under the mattress or something like that. That's where all the savings went. So it's the exact same thing. Now I'm gonna answer some of your questions immediately. This is called real personal consumption expenditures. This is consumer spending, personal, and it's how much money people spent. And it goes back to 2018. You can see it growing over time at a pretty constant rate. I could have gone back further, but it's easier to see the graph this way. And then COVID hit and it dropped dramatically. And then the government gave us stimulus checks and uh, added on to our unemployment compensation and personal income went way up. We had more personal income than ever. Okay, yeah, look what happened to spending. It only came back slowly. It's only gotten back to about where it was. So when people say did all this $5 trillion of deficit spending that was given to people, cause overspending? Not really. We're not even spending what we would have spent before if this COVID thing hadn't happened. What it did do was it, it uh, made it more difficult on what's called the supply side, things offered for sale. People weren't working, ships weren't sailing, and so there weren't uh, as many things offered for sale. And uh, costs went up. We had tariffs that were the Trump tariffs, which was the worst thing you could imagine. And then uh, President Biden doubled down on those, which was again bad. And it's government policy to make prices higher. So there are a lot of things that made prices higher, but it wasn't some dramatic increase in spending. 
was things that were happening on what's called the supply side, the costs of things that were offered for sale. And I think we are ready to take questions. Okay, fantastic. So the first person's question we're gonna take is um, Terrence Cudney. Would you like to unmute Terrence and ask your question? Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay, awesome. So thanks so much for your presentation, Warren. So um, I'm running for state Senate as an independent in uh, Massachusetts on the North Shore. And um, I'm going to use, uh, I guess, uh, language from Stephanie Kelton's book, uh, Deficit Myth, uh, which you haven't directly referenced here, but hopefully it translates uh, fairly readily. So my, yes. my question is, uh, how can state officials and candidates be advocates for or build policy around uh, MMT as representatives of, you know, what's called a currency user, not a currency issue, issuer um, in uh, Stephanie Kelton's book. Okay, so that's uh, critical to under the understanding that the states got together and gave all this authority to the federal government to be used for public purpose. And now the government has got it backwards. They got the sequence backwards and they're they've got the wrong concerns, right? And they're not acting for public purpose. And let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say they'd like to act in public purpose. They think they are, but they're, they have other fears and concerns that uh, you know and I know now that are misconstrued. And we'd like to get them straightened out. So it's up to the states to form alliances with other states, get together in Congress with representatives, uh, have the state governments work with your congressional representatives get them squared away. People like Elizabeth Warren should be able to understand this. She seems pretty smart and uh, went to college and all that. <laughs> and, and you've got to get them on board. So you have to do everything possible to get your federal representatives on board to, uh, to do their job and make sure that you know, they're um, not overtaxing you uh, for the amount of spending that they want to do. So if they want to do $5 trillion in spending, they automatically think that means $5 trillion in taxes. Well, it doesn't. To the extent that there's net savings desires in the economy, that might mean only $4 trillion in taxes or $3 trillion. So uh, if they want to tax $5 trillion, fine, but then they're going to have to spend $6 or $7 trillion. There's got to be a difference so that the economy has the ability to net save. So they have to understand that. You don't just match that up, and that's how you do it. Okay, and so, and it's not that hard to understand. You've read the deficit, myth. they can understand that. And so it's incumbent on you to get your representatives and get with other state representatives to get their representatives on board to understand this. And that, you know, before, when Massachusetts was independent state, uh, before uh, 1776, sure, you had your own script and you could do this. In fact, they, you did do it. I think you had a $5 million issue of your own script back then to, and did and understood this, and that's exactly what you did. Uh, but those you you ceded that authority to the to Congress, and now you you know we've made our bed. Now we have to sleep in it. Warren, would you mind um, to stop sharing your screen so that everybody oh, can see you? Yes, you tired of looking at it? Let me uh, figure out how to do that here. Uh, the screen, share screen on the bottom. Just click yeah. on that. So, yeah, my problem is I've got my box up there. Here we go. Stop share. There, there we, go. we go. Perfect. Okay. Good. okay. And so uh, the next person we're going to call on uh, to unmute is Derek Miles to ask your question. Welcome, Derek. Andy, can you unlock him? I'm not able to somehow. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I appreciate the time. Um, so I previously uh, received a response from you detailing some of the conflicts that the GPUS platform and MMT have, and uh, you welcome me to share those uh, responses, so I will be sure to do so uh, promptly. Uh, what I'd like to expand on is maybe uh, with the brief overview that you've had with the GPUS platform, uh, in your mind, what were some of the most important factors that Greens need to be considering 
uh, if we want to reframe our platform with MMT in mind. Okay, so I've also done a uh, brief piece where I rewrote the preamble and the values, in, mm -hmm. you know, in line. And so what I tried to do was keep the real values there, keep the real uh, emphasis of the preamble there, but eliminate the counterproductive aspects of monetary operations that somehow got their way into the, uh, the originals. And without those things in there, I think it's much more powerful, more focused, and more to what you want to get done in real terms. I mean, number one, you want to save the planet. Number one, you want to see certain human rights enforced. And so, by um, and, and so, I, I attempted to do that. And so, I'd urge you to uh, to look at both of those uh, pages I did. And if you have something specific, I don't have them in front of me right now. I could I could address them. I know you started off with balancing the budget because it was leaving debt to our grandchildren. Correct. That's uh, in our in our platform. Yeah. So look, once you understand the sequence that the government spends first, you know, all the public debt is that the dollars the government has spent that are still out there and they haven't been used to pay taxes and they're just dollars that can be used to pay taxes or tax credits. There's no nothing to be paid off. What we call the public debt are those dollars that are in treasury securities which are savings accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank, functionally. They're just time deposits at the Fed. They give them a fancy name and call them treasury securities. And when they come due, those dollars are shifted from those accounts at the Federal Reserve to, you know, which I, let's call them savings accounts, to checking accounts at the Federal Reserve. And then your money's, you know, when it comes due, it's gone from your savings account at the Fed to your checking account. And they say, okay, what do you want to do now? So, all paying it back means is shifting it from one account at the Federal Reserve to another. It's like if you have a savings account at a commercial bank, let's say you have a one-year savings account and the commercial bank owes you that money. So it's their debt. So Bank America, JP Morgan might have $2 trillion of debt money that people have in savings accounts. Okay. And when it comes due, what do they have to do? They, the money goes from your savings account to your checking account. Okay. And then, the same thing's happening at the Federal Reserve. So that's how they like pay off their debt. Now, if somebody said like, we want all the banks to pay off their debt, that would mean somehow they would charge everybody a big fat fee and no, everybody's money would be gone because that's the money supply. The money you have in bank accounts is the money supply in the economy. And so a growing economy needs a growing money supply. Why would you want to, a federal money supply to go to zero? If, again, it's there's no, when, when the, it happens on the 15th of every month when treasury securities mature. The Fed does what they call debiting securities accounts. They change the numbers down. They credit the reserve accounts. They change the numbers up. They shift the money from savings to checking. There are no taxpayers in the room and there are no grandchildren in sight. It's got nothing to do with that. And so unfortunately, the word debt carries these other connotations and they've been jumped on by politicians for a long time. But if you notice, in the last two years, we're hearing a lot less of that. Okay, and it's because most of them now have read Stephanie's book. Most of them have somehow figured out, you know, basic monetary operations and that this is not the issue they thought it would be. Though some of them are still saying this thing about leaving debt to our grandchildren, it's gotten a whole lot quieter and hopefully that'll go away in the next year or two. So everybody knows this, it's gone away. If you're left out there with this as one of your platform things, you just lose your credibility. It just looked foolish and like, you're, you know, you're like, you just wave, you know, the train's left and without you. And, uh, and it doesn't serve the purpose of saving the planet and it doesn't serve the purpose of um, social equity. So given those two purposes, uh, you've got every reason in the world to drop that and get it. Uh, so it's in line with how it actually works. And by the way, you know, look, I've visited the Fed for a lot, many years. I've visited the Bank of England and, all the um, st staff people, the senior staff, the, the financial professionals who actually do the work, you know, they agree with me 100%. There's nothing even to discuss. Uh, Vince Reinhardt, who was uh, head of monetary affairs at the uh, Fed under Greenspan, he was his right-hand man, and under Chairman Bernanke, he was his right-hand man. He helped me write some of my speeches. Okay, so this is, there's nothing in here that's not factual information about how monetary operations work. Thank you. Yeah. So our next question is coming from Joseph Polito. Would you please unmute? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, I uh, read your uh, very interesting list of banking proposals that you wrote some years ago. Mm -hmm. And your proposal for the Treasury was really interesting, but I'm afraid I, I didn't quite understand it. It says, I would cease all issuances of Treasury securities. Instead, any deficit would accumulate as excess reserve balances at the Fed. My guess was that you were saying the money would be directly uh, transferred to the Treasury. But if you could please elaborate on that very interesting proposal. Thanks. Okay. so. Uh let me just ask, when, when socialism in the dictionary means the government owns all the means of production, is that still the case? Is that how you're using the word? Uh, I don't see the word socialism. Um, it, it, said, it said, I would cease all issuance yes. of treasury securities. Yeah, no, I understand. But before that, you premised it with a, this mention of socialism. So... Um, no, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about socialism. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so let me answer your question. So here's how spending works. Co Congress authorizes spending, you know, a trillion dollars to send out checks to people, $1,400 checks or whatever it was. The Treasury then um, instructs the Fed to make the payments and they then uh, credit the accounts of all the appropriate member banks, which might be Bank of America or JP Morgan or Wells Fargo, that correspond to the people who are getting the checks, right? And those uh, accounts get a credit balance in them. So they mark them up by a trillion dollars. And then they mark down the treasury's balance by a trillion dollars. Now, if the treasury's balance was zero, uh, that would make them minus a trillion. And the, Fed, the current policy is for the Fed not to do that. It's not a law, it's just a policy. It actually doesn't make any difference whether they do it or not, but they don't do it. So there's a policy that says you can't do that. So what the treasury does is they go out and sell treasury securities uh, that, to the economy. That trillion dollars that the uh, Fed just credited to all the member banks is then used to buy a trillion dollars of treasury securities from the treasury. Okay, the Fed debits the bank's trillion dollars from their reserve accounts, the, the money it just gave it, it now shifts it into their savings accounts called treasury securities. Okay, and then they credit the treasury for the trillion dollars and now it, it's back to zero. So, uh, and uh, they have certain days of the month they do that and there's some smoothing out things that go on, but that's that's fundamentally what's happening underneath it all. All right, so the, uh, so what I'm saying is, when the, the actual spending is the Fed simply, you know, the Fed is a bank and it's got a spreadsheet. And it's got all these member banks have lines on the spreadsheet and it just credits their line by however much they're supposed to get, this total of a trillion dollars. Those are called reserves. That's all we have to do for spending. We don't have to then have those reserves get used to buy treasury securities and then shift those reserves from reserve accounts to securities accounts. There's no reason to do that. Now, there was a very good reason to do that when we were on the gold standard. When you're on the gold standard, those reserves can be cashed in for gold and the Fed can run out of gold. But today you can't do that anymore. You know, the only thing you get for a $10 bill is two fives. You can't get any gold from the government. You have to go out in the market. And so there's no reason, it doesn't matter to the Fed or the Treasury or anybody else whether those dollars are in reserve accounts or in securities accounts. So it's an anachronism from the gold standard. So I'm saying there's no longer any reason to do that. So all we have to do is Treasury instructs the Fed, you know, lawfully. Congress says spend a trillion. They tell the Fed to go ahead and credit the accounts for a trillion. Fed makes sure that Treasury has authority from Congress. They then add the trillion to different member bank accounts as appropriate. Let the treasury go minus a trillion on their books for accounting purposes, and that's it. They're done. And so what we're left with is the economy holding a trillion dollars in reserve accounts instead of previously, they would have been holding a trillion dollars in securities accounts. And nothing else changes. Nothing changes for the economy, for inflation, for anything. Uh, it's just uh, the dollars have shifted. Now, more recently, what I've said is you know, to, well, to do this, you need a major change in policy where you have to allow the treasury to go negative and you have to uh, 
you know, and you'll get these debates in Congress about whether that's printing money and whether it's causing inflation. We can get to that point without going through any of that process, even though it doesn't matter. They think it matters. We can avoid all that by just limiting the treasury to a sale of three month treasury bills and forget all the long term securities. Because three months treasuries are functionally the same as reserves overnight accounts. Uh, you know, in the, in the money markets and everywhere else, nobody trades them. Nobody's making any money on them. Uh, they don't. There's no volatility. So, if we just say to the Treasury, "Look, you can't sell anything longer than a three-month bill," then we'll be, uh, for all practical purposes, in the same place as if we tell them to, uh, if we just run ex excess reserves and allow the Treasury to go negative. So, I've uh, more recently, in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, been you know, proposing we have a permanent zero rate policy and limit the treasury to three month bills. To do that, the treasury has an office of debt management. They decide whether they want three month bills or six months or one year or 10 years or 30 years. And they're always changing it. So treasury can just say, all right, we're limiting it to three month bills. It doesn't have to go to Congress or it doesn't have to be any debate, nothing. And the Fed's already got a zero rate policy. They can just vote at their meetings to leave it there permanently. And that's it, then we're done. So. Right now, we can go to a permanent zero rate policy that Treasury will never pay any interest again. The Treasury can go to only three month bills. There'll never be any uh, Treasury bonds or securities, uh, you know, for all practical purposes to speak of. And we can get to where we want to be overnight uh, without any um, uh, change in institutional structure. Th does that help? It sure does. That was great. Okay. Thanks so much. Good. Sure. Our next question is from Dan Holmes. Can you please unmute Dan? So, hi. Um, I heard criticism of, um, I've read um, Stephanie Kelton's book um, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought that was, it was good. And I thought it was basically self-explanatory to somebody like me, who's a lay person who I have a background in maths and physics and computer science, but nothing to, in economics. I understood it and it was, it seemed, self-explanatory to me, but I've heard criticism along the lines of there are no credible academic papers in well-respected economics journals um, that, you know, show what MMT is about and how it works and, and criticize it um, in contrast to the existing, you know, other models and, and what have you, that sort of um, thing. And therefore it can't be credible because why, you know, yeah. if the so let, me, it, so let me say, I published a paper called Maximizing Price Stability in a Monetary Economy and I co-authored with uh, Professor Salipo Damiano who did all the, the detail work for me because I didn't know how to get published. And it was published in the Journal of Policy Models, which is the number two mainstream economic journal in the world, peer reviewed. It's right there. It's full blown MMT recommending the European Central Bank use a um, employed buffer stock, a transition job guarantee, which is the more casually known as a job guarantee as an additional tool to achieve price stability in the European Union, because the tools they have don't work. The interest rate tool is backwards. We showed all of that. We showed how the uh, sequence of spending is what I just explained. When you, uh, we went through the accounts at the European Central Bank and ran all the regression analysis for, for what's happened over the years to show, to demonstrate it. It's all there hundred percent, you know, leading mainstream journal peer reviewed for anybody to read for, I can't get the M other MMT proponents to promote this. I'm not sure why, but it would certainly put to rest all those objections. And it's right there for all of you to see if you wanna use it. I've put it on Twitter several times and um, you know, I'm doing the best I can. And I, but it is the only um, MMT uh, proponents, you know, any paper by MMT proponents that have been published in a mainstream journal. And it's a big one and it's uh, has, strong impact it doesn't pull any punches and it's right there so does that, does that help yeah i'd love to read that can you put a yeah. link to it or something or, or something sure else so i can find uh, it if you, if you google maximizing price stability in a monetary economy warren mosler it'll come right up there's the levy institute published my first draft which is pretty much the same thing but if you read down uh there's, um, you'll get to the journal, you'll get to the place that publishes a journal of po policy mo modeling or whatever they call it. And you can, you can see it in the mainstream journal itself. So it's at the Levy Institution has it. 
it's at the, uh, you can see the journal article itself and I've got it on my website, a copy of it under mandatory readings. Uh, on, it's moslereconomics.com. And then you can always email me if you still can't find it, I'll get it to you. That's great, thanks. Sure. Uh, Ralph McNall has a question. You can unmute Ralph. Okay, you want the first question or the second one? You could ask yeah. both. Okay. Uh, I think the second one's a little more interesting. Europeans have suggested MMT could be implemented within a country, for example, Greece, as a local electronic only currency. Uh, I've also read that something similar apparently has been done by some U.S. cities in the past. Is this something that uh, U.S. states could do? Okay, so you don't implement MMT, right? It's like, um, you know, it's like the theory of gravity or something. It explains how gravity works. So MMT explains how a monetary system works, whether it's fixed exchange rate, floating exchange rate, closed economy, open economy. Okay, so if somebody proposes a currency for Greece, I can look at it through the MMT lens and tell you whether that's gonna work or how it's gonna work or what's gonna happen and how to, how to analyze what they've done. Uh, I can also, um, I know what some people have done so I could preempt that and say, okay, what they did at the UMKC with the Buckaroo currency is this or what, they, uh, what was done with Ithaca dollars is that, you know, and I can show you how that works. But to say implement MMT in Greece doesn't doesn't tell me anything. It's kind of a non-starter. You'd have to say uh, uh, levy a new tax in a new currency. How would that work if they had taxes both in euro and both in drachma? You know, something like that. The question would have to go. Or they would levy their own. I don't know. Uh, requirement for something. So you have to give me some details about what you're trying to do because there have been a lot of places have tried a lot of different things and I can always tell you what they are and what the dynamics are and how they work. Thank you. Um, the other yeah, question oh, for was... example, for the example, for the Virgin Islands, I proposed they could, or California, when they were having financial issues, I was proposing they could issue their own tax credits that were good for pay, that could be payable, used to pay California taxes, and they could spend those for a while until they got themselves sorted out. So that was, you know, a proposal I had about how they could use tax credits, but it doesn't apply to every state all the time. It's targeted towards specific situation, specific public purpose. Yeah, it was focused on that, and it was focused on, uh, you know, guaranteed jobs. You know. Yeah. And that's that's problematic. You know, you can do it, but it's it, it's not it was, what people think it is. Yeah, and it was a dual currency type of situation where yeah. taxes yeah. would be in both currencies and pay yeah. you know, purchasing things could potentially be in both currencies. Right. So you know, look at it this way. Let's say the the Africans, the British tax was ten thousand crown, and they were only spending nine thousand. People getting their houses burned down. Could they start their own local currency to keep people employed do, doing other things? Yeah, but they're still going to be getting their houses burned down. So, you know, you've got kind of independent circuits here. And so, yes, they could be used to employ local labor, but it's not going to stop the, what this external circuit is doing to them. And so that's kind of, that's an analogy that you might keep in mind when people propose these things. The other question had to do with China and other countries that hold a lot of uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, yeah. That, and you've commented time and again that uh, basically they, you know, they ha have the dollars, but, you know, that's it. Uh, but doesn't that present an inflation, potential inflation problem, especially when they use right. those dollars to go building up, buying up property? Yeah, so look, a Apple Computer has $250 billion and the state of California Teachers Retirement Fund has, I don't know how many, probably a trillion dollars or something like that. So, and insurance companies have billions and trillions of dollars. So you've got, uh, if the public debt is 28 trillion, that means there's 28 trillion in dollars out there. The government has spent, haven't been used to pay taxes. There, there's somebody's savings out there. 
And if everybody spent all their savings at once, yes, they're going to drive up prices, to, you know, while, until they run out. So, you know, until it stops, let's put it that way. Uh, so that's always the case. So China is no different than anyone else with savings, where that's certainly a possibility. You know, as kids, we used to say, what if everybody in China jumped up in the air at the same time? You know, would that throw the earth off its access? Well, access, you know, well, it might, I don't know. But uh, th th these are always things that can happen. What if nobody, the paradox of thrift, you know, what if nobody spent anything for the next month? What would happen to the U.S. economy? Well, GDP would go to zero. Well, is that a risk? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's not, um, so China having the, these dollars is, it's one of those risks that they go out and try and buy new cars or something with it, I guess. Uh, you gotta remember the reason they're collecting these dollars is to keep their currency uh, and their wages competitive, you know, which they are, the labor costs are a lot lower over there. So they can net export to us. And so if they decide not to have them anymore, that would be a decision not to be able to net export to the United States anymore. And while that would be to the benefit of their macro economy, it's, it's totally against their ideology right now, their politics, and their exporters are the ones in control who get the profits from this at the, at the expense of the macro economy. So it's not, it's pretty far-fetched that this would happen. And if it did, you know, you would just wind up re-denominating. It means for every car they sold us for $30,000, if they want to go to U.S. and spend the money and buy cars, they got to pay 100000 so, you know, who's in real terms, who's winning? They sell us cars for 30 and buy them back for 100. They sell us, you know, 25 million cars and get back five or something. So, so, so what? It's not, that's a victory for us, sort of, in real terms. It doesn't hurt our real wealth. It's disruptive, but it doesn't hurt our real wealth. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Herb Weissman. Can you unmute Herb? Am I there yet? Yes, you are. Yes. A fun thing that I've discussed with people and it came out of the um, material and values written by Mark Carney, who was the former governor of the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, he defined money as a measure of value. And I think it's still confusing for a lot of people as to what money is. And yeah. I wanted you to comment on that, Warren, if you have sure. a chance. Right. So it's a simple tax credit. It's a thing that could be used to pay taxes. So if, if you uh, put up a solar project for $30,000 and you get a 30% federal tax credit of $9,000, that, that tax credit is money. It's worth $9,000. And if, if it was transferable and I was doing my taxes, I, I'd, you wanted to sell it, I mean, I'd buy it from you. I'd probably pay up to you know $8,999 to save a dollar on my tax return, right? <laughs> And so anything the government says can be used to pay taxes uh, has that much value. If they say your signed business card can be used to pay $100 in taxes, you can sell them to, for very close to $100 all day long, you know, until the government decides otherwise. So anything that can be used to pay taxes has that much value, uh, really, uh, as uh, by definition. The tax liability can only be uh, satisfied with the tax credits, which come from the government, they tell you what can be used to pay it and how much, how many of them you need to pay it. And that's what the that's what the dollar is. That's what the yen is. That's what the euro is. Thanks, Warren. Yep, oh, sure. That's good. Yep. We have our next question is from Vijay. I'm going to read it. Um, what is an MMT informed policy response to a recent price increases? Given signaling from the central banks that there may be increases to the policy rate. Yeah, so those are two separate things. The correct response to the central bank is you've got it backwards. If you raise rates, you're going to cause more inflation. You don't want to do that. And I've got a paper out you can read on that. 
and so does Richard Warner from the Bank of England back in 2017, and so do lots of other recent papers show that um, raising rates tends to promote more inflation, not to fight it. There have been a lot of recent things out there showing how what the causes of price increases are and how raising rates would only make it worse. So number one, the central bank shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't even be threatening to do that, but they are. Now, whether they sell their portfolio or don't sell their portfolio or add to it, that doesn't make any difference. But raising rates will make inflation worse. And they should be doing that if they're worried about inflation. Uh, from my last chart, you can see that the problem is not overspending. The problem is from policy, like the tariffs. We eliminate the tariffs. That would change things dramatically. Housing prices have gone up. Lumber has gone from 400 to 1,700 because we had tariffs from President Trump. And then we had um, some problems with sawmills or shortages or trees in Canada. Didn't have enough rain or had too much rain or something. And speculators piled in, went up to 1,700. And then the price collapsed about I don't know, five or 600, almost all the way back down. And then President Biden doubled the tariff, another $17, 100 board feet or whatever it was. So it's up to 17%. So it's up to like a 34% tariff. And we're mad at Canada because they're not charging us enough for lumber. And so we're raising the price to Americans because they won't by adding tariffs. This is madness. It really is. And then you say, well, why are prices going up? What do we have to do about it? Should we raise? It's a public policy to raise the price of lumber, which raises the price of building a house, which raises the price of repairing your house and maintaining it and getting you know, in the price of, of used houses. And so, uh, and then we've had all kinds of uh, shipping problems due to COVID and due to tariffs, which changed a lot of the uh, supply chains. People were buying things from places that suddenly got slapped with tariffs. And so they had to buy from somewhere else and all kinds of disruption. So th these are all being caused by policy. And you've seen the lines at the ports and the ships waiting off shore and what you do about it is exactly what President Biden has been doing about it. He's been making it worse with the tariffs, but he's done some things right, such as uh, targeting the price of oil, saying and looking to Saudi Arabia and Russia, but, uh, you know, and so releasing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to try and get prices down, but he went about it all wrong. And he went about it in a way to make it worse. But it's the type of thing you want to do. You want to target the problem areas. He's only lending money from lending oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Exxon just borrowed two million barrels that they have to pay back with interest. They pay back a little bit more. So how does that affect the price? I don't know. And um, he's telling OPEC they need to pump more oil. And today, when they voted to increase production by quotas by four hundred thousand, he's White House. Uh, thank them and they're congratulating them. That has nothing to do with the price. They have a monopoly at the margin. They set the price. They let the refiners buy all they want. There's no shortage of oil driving up prices. Every refiner who wants one more ounce of oil just goes and buys it at the going price. They're a monopolist that sets price and lets quantity adjust. And yet we've got our politicians and economists and everybody else talking about the supply demand balance and whether they're you know, how can they pump more? They've got it for sale at $80 a barrel. Nobody wants to buy any. And they say pump more. Are they supposed to pump it out in the street or something? Okay. And, but, they don't, but they don't want anyone to know they're setting prices. So they have these meetings and they raise quotas to show that they're pumping more. And this thinly disguised price setting uh, continues. And so we don't know the actual cost of the price. And so we're taking measures that are not going to be effective. And right now it's the Russians and the Saudis together conspiring, if you will, but to set price. We know what they did with natural gas prices in Europe. Who knows what they're going to do uh, with oil? Last time around, it was up to 155 before they broke the world economy in 2008. They might be doing the same thing, but nobody even has an inkling of, underst of understanding of how it's working. The other thing uh, the president did was he went around to the ports to try to get them to work more hours and bring prices down. Again, it's the right idea target the areas that need it when you have supply side issues to try and bring it down. Look, there's another interesting thing, and I'm going to bring this up because it's the Green Party and nobody talks about it. But one week after COVID, we had a massive drop in demand, spending. You saw that chart. It dropped dramatically, everything else. And all we did was give up non-essentials. 
And at the same time, emissions dropped 50% approximately globally. And you could see China from space for the first time. This is a huge victory for you know, being green. Like nobody could have possibly imagined. How do you cut emissions 50% in one day? But we did. Okay, and so, and we did it by cutting out non-essentials. Now, how essential is it to cut out emissions? If that's somewhere up on a high priority list, maybe these other non-essentials were less essential than cutting emissions, right? But there's no dialogue, no discussion. So for the next year, we worked diligently to bring back these non-essentials and restore our emissions to prior levels and even exceed them. And now we're looking at ways to cut the growth of emissions so that you know, in 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, we can have levels far higher than what we had you know, a year or so ago through direct conservation. With no, no, I'm not saying these non-essentials, none of them should have been brought back. Well, maybe I am. I'm personally, I'm saying none of them should have been brought back. If they're non-essentials, nobody was dying. We have enough food to eat. Why are we bringing these back if we're risking life on the planet? But we did. Okay. And I didn't hear any, maybe there was a response from the Green Party, but I, I, it sure didn't get to me. So maybe the public relations didn't get through. But uh, so anyway, I have to get this out there. I, I don't know if that makes me too extreme for you guys or what, but we can do all this through conservation. And I've, I've gotten off the, your question a little bit, but I, I, th I think it makes a point there that uh, we're worried about these price increases. We're worried about um, these things. We can bring back the supply of all these things. We can unclog the ports. We can restore China at full exports and Vietnam and everywhere else. And they can go out and burn more coal and build all these things to send to us. And we can restore all our services. People can drive to go out to eat every day and burn more gasoline, just like we did before and, and bring the prices down. I mean, what kind of a, you know, victory is that? <laughs> it's not my idea of victory, but, and if you look at this inflation we're talking about, we've had a one-time adjustment of about 6% in the price level from depressed prices of the year before with forecasts that it's all gonna go back down, that it is a one-time event. The long-term forecast from the Fed, from the Congressional Budget Office and from the free markets, so to speak, treasury securities is we're somewhere still in the 2% long-term range, maybe two and a half. There isn't uh, an inflation situation right now. There's been a one-time adjustment to some supply shocks, not caused by overspending, caused by supply side issues that are working their way out. How important is it to get the supply side back up to restore all the harmful emissions that go with it? Uh, you know, I'd like to see the Green Party take a position different from the other two parties. At least for me, that's what I'm looking for. And if you don't, if we don't, then we're going to wind up with the same nothing percent we've always had because there isn't any difference. Am I in trouble now, uh, Ramona? No, you're not in trouble okay. at all. Okay. This is kind of why we're doing this because we want the right. Greens to win. Right. <laughs> um, so um, uh, Alan has a question. I think you answered it, but I think maybe he wants you to go more in depth. If deficit spending and increased money supply does not cause inflation, then under MMT theory, what causes inflation? It's the prices paid by the government when it spends. Okay, so what would cause it in Africa? What would cause, you know, the price of a, a uh, bushel of um, berries to go from one crown, in, you know, one crown to two crowns? Well, if the government, if the British are paying one crown a day for labor, uh, then a bushel is worth one crown because it takes somebody else a day to do a bushel of berries. If the government pays two crowns a day, okay, now a bushel would be cost two crowns. You can only get a half a bushel for one crown because it only takes a half a day to earn a one crown. So. The, the value of the currency depends on how hard it is to get from the government. If they make it harder to get, the money's worth more. If they make it easier to get, it's worth less. If they just give it away for free and you don't have to work for it at the margin, anybody can get it for free, it's not worth anything. If the British imposed a tax of you know 100 crown a month on your house and just gave 100 crown to everybody, money crown wouldn't be worth anything. 
But if they say, hey, you got to come work in the coffee plantation, we pay one a day or we're going to burn your house down. Now it's worth something. So it's at the end of the day, it's worth what the government says you have to do to get it. Now in market talk, like if I was talking to uh, some highfalutin, you know, mainstream economists, I would be saying things like, uh, look, markets can only set relative value. They can only tell you how much something is worth relative to something else. They can tell you uh, that the uh, price of silver is going to be 20 times or 100 times the price of gold. Or, I'm sorry, price of gold is going to be 100 times the price of silver. If silver is $20 an ounce, gold is going to be 2000 And they'll go into all the reasons how markets set these relative values. But if you say, oh, you know, I'm talking about yen instead of dollars, they say, oh, okay, well, it's still 100 times. That's what our models tell us. But now you got to multiply everything times 100 because everything in yen is 100 times more. So they don't care what the currency is. They don't, markets don't care about absolute value. They only sort out relative value. And absolute value has to come from outside the market. And in this case, we have a monopolist, uh, uh, a currency monopolist. And so the only possible source of absolute value is from the government through the prices they pay at the margin when they spend. And that can all be traced back. And, uh, and the mainstream models have to be organized accordingly. Now, they recently used to think that, well, not recently, that for a while now, a long time, decades, they've been thinking inflation expectations determine inflation. The Fed monitors those and does surveys and responds to changes. And recently, papers have come out showing inflation expectations have nothing to do with it. And I could have told you that before. So when the government uh, starts paying 6% more for everything, which it will do, because it doesn't understand this is the source of the price level, then that will uh, shift the price level by 6%. Every time the government does it, it's a one-time shift. Now, it might be good policy to do that and say, look, everything's just going to be 6% higher. If they said, no, we're not going to pay a penny more than we did last year, government spending, you know, apart from transfer payments, would all go to zero. And then there's no money to pay the tax. And so the whole economy deflates. And the only way to get money to pay the tax is to try and sell things to each other, but the price goes down and down until they get to the government's price and the government buys it. Now there's money there to pay the tax. It's a very ugly process. It's detrimental to everybody. It's a lot less painful to just say we're shifting up 6% right now and do it. So the answer is going to be somewhere in between. Uh, and there are going to be people that get hurt, people that get benefited. But let's look at the real wealth of the country. Okay, The real wealth is all the real stuff we produce domestically, You know, goods and services, uh, and so the higher the level of domestic employment, the more real stuff we make and the more our real wealth is. That's the stuff we can eat and drink and drive around and, you know, do uh, play games on our computer. with. That's the real wealth that we make, all the, all the goods and services. That's the haircuts we get. That's the people cooking us dinner, all this stuff. All right. That's our pile of stuff. Now, you want your pile of stuff to be as large as possible, apart from the fact that it's producing emissions for the moment. Uh, and to do, because to, that's your real wealth. So everything we import adds to our real wealth. It makes the pile bigger. And everything we export makes our real wealth small. The level of the currency doesn't change our real wealth. If the dollar goes down, we still have everything we produce domestically, plus what we import minus what we export. So it, it affects, what it does affect is distribution within the economy. So there's winners and there's losers, but the total stuff is still there. And our real wealth is highest when we're at full employment. So the reason to get the full employment from an economics point of view and from a pure you know, um, self-interest point of view, or what, what do you want to call it, the uh, economic benefit, is to be at full employment because then we're getting the most stuff. We have the biggest pile of stuff we could produce domestically. It's higher. Now, well, all I hear from so many proponents is are these bleeding heart arguments, which I have... 100% sympathy with. It's immoral to have unemployment. It's a human right to a job. It's all this. Well, what about the idea that we're losing enormous amounts of real wealth to unemployment? The losses from unemployment by not having everybody employed you know, in any given year right now are higher than the real losses, not human life, but the real goods and services from, from the destruction of every war in the history of the world combined. And we're giving up that much real wealth, that much standard of living by being at less than full employment. Now, you know, who's against that? When you understand that, now it's okay, well, what do we have to do to get there? The biggest gains we can make are to get to full employment. 
And so now when we talk about these proposals to get the full employment, you've got everybody listening, not just the people who think it's a human right. Okay. And so, uh, and, that, and again, not that I don't, I back that stuff a hundred percent, but when I, when you limit it with that, or when you lead with that, you're, you're leaving out a lot of people that would otherwise be on your side. We're not against that, but that's not enough for them to uh, come into the tent because they're worried about all these other things that don't exist. Okay. Like it's going to cause inflation or something like that. Those people earning money is going to make me poor because there's going to be less to go around. It's not true. It makes everybody better off. Okay. Every Tea Party member is better off when there's full employment. And so, you know, all the moral hazard of full employment, it isn't there if you do it the right way that they imagine. Instead, everybody's better off. So all my proposals and explanations lead with these universal things that bring everybody in uh, to these, what I call uh, purely progressive programs. And uh, I've given the same talk to uh, Jamie Galbraith's left-wing communists in Paris to, the, you know, one week, and they're all in favor of it. And then Dallas Tea Party, right-wing nutcases next week, and they're all in favor of it. I know it has universal appeal, okay? And I'm not going to get everybody's, you know, agreement on gun control or anything like that. But on these economic things, I know I can Okay, Virginia has a question. Go ahead, Virginia. Thank you. So, Warren, you've, you've, you know, I've, I hear you speak about how the government sets prices, but how does the, how does the price setting of monopolies uh, fit, fit in there? Because we know that that there are certain industries like energy yeah. that that just said a, a price is abusively. So how does yes, that fit yes. all of this? Okay, so I agree with you. And so does Teddy Roosevelt, right? Republican, <laughs> mainstream Republican, who was a big trust buster, who broke up Standard Oil and broke up all these people for exactly that reason. And I agree with that, you know, 100%, although there's an argument on the other side for all, you know, in general, I agree with Teddy and what he did 100%. And it sounds like, you do too. And so what you have from an economics point of view is when you don't have sufficient competition to keep margins in line and to uh, keep prices in line and to keep value in line, then the government has, it serves public purpose for the government to regulate that to one degree or another to make sure public purpose is being served. Absolutely. And they're not doing it. And you had the Republicans you know, got those departments in uh, uh, Washington that are the regulatory agencies that are supposed to be looking into this and deciding who to prosecute for antitrust and who not to. And your congressman should be looking at the same thing, you know, who's, uh, which industries have sufficient competition where we don't need to worry about them. You don't have to regulate every gas station. If you've got two gas stations across the street from each other, they compete. That's not the problem. The problem is, you know, if you have one oil company or if you've got the Saudis. <laughs> now, when we have a foreign monopolist setting price, now we have a problem of diplomacy. Now it's up to the president to have the fifth fleet, you know, looming off of Saudi Arabia and saying, uh, gee, what are you doing with your OSPs, your official selling prices this month? You're going to keep the price pretty much neutral, aren't you? And not try and gouge us anymore. Okay, hint. All right, but he doesn't do that because he doesn't even know how the process works and neither do his advisors, you know, like that, like Jared Bernstein, people who advise him. They, they're all looking at quantities and stuff. So when they've all got it wrong, they don't take the appropriate measures against or to work with constructively with foreign monopolists. What about long-term contracts? Canada, Mexico supply more than enough oil that we need to import. Why can't we get together with them and do a 30-year contract at a price that they're happy with, that we're happy with, and we have a stable price for 30 or 40 years. If it's too high and we make a mistake, fine. They win a little bit, we lose, but we have you know, relative price stability. If the price is too low, okay, they made a mistake, but that's, that's how long-term contracting works. And they would rather have long-term contracting. So when they do drilling, and again, I cringe when I say this because I don't wanna do any of this, okay? I'm just talking, answering a question about how we guarantee prices. Let me change examples. I'm making myself sick here. So when China wants to buy meat from Argentina, 
that wants to buy more meat, they don't just go in the spot market and start bidding up the price. They send a delegation to Argentina. They talk to them that they need so many billion pounds of meat or whatever. Uh, that, that's not good for the air either, is it? Well, all right, I'll, I'll stay with this one. Argentina then takes them out on horses and shows them a couple million acres that aren't being used, that could be used. They come up with their cost structure or long-term, you know, some profit margin. They come into a 20-year contract with Argentina to buy beef. They don't just do it in the spot market. So most commodities like that do it that way. If you have a power plant, they'll build it. And before they build their power plant, they've talked to the natural gas suppliers and the coal miners to make sure they have long-term contracts to get the stuff they need at you know affordable prices based on where they can sell power. They try to do that. So in the real world, apart from government, most companies try to lock in long-term contracts like uh, Tesla just locked in long-term contract with somebody to mine lithium. Another wonderful thing to be doing to the earth, okay? But that's how it works. But with oil and energy from a national standpoint, the consumer, our government doesn't do that. They don't lock in long-term contracts for us for stability that would serve public purpose, but it's all there to be done, okay? And so there's so many things the government could do for us that we can't do individually, but we can do collectively to lock in some stable things without taking away our choice, without taking away our freedoms, without doing this, but just to have us work together as a team for certain essentials, you know, that to provide stability for our platform that does everything else. Instead of having all these disruptive things that are just, we're just driving down the road and slamming into the guardrails first on the left side, then on the right side. They, so many things could just keep us in the middle of the road, uh, you know, while we're, as we're progressing. Yeah, I'll stop here on that. Thank you, Warren. Um, Jeff Edder um, has a question. Please unmute Jeff. Hello, can you hear me, Warren? Yes. Yeah, I actually would like to debate you on your stab hypothesis. Okay. Uh, you fired back a few things on Twitter. Um, but I know this is not the place to do it because um, uh, there's just not enough time to cover all the nuances of it. Okay. But um, uh, you can use what? my email. Okay, sure. If you or, or just message me on Twitter and we can get started. Have you yeah. have you read my seven deadly innocent frauds? Yeah, and okay. I would prefer, yeah, I would prefer to like have an actual debate with the moderator if you're interested. Oh. But for the question, what is your definition of currency? Because what I notice is that MMTers, they conflate currency with all money creation. Right. I don't do so, that. And, and I just want to ask you, do you agree that the majority of digital money in circulation is created through the loans process? Okay. So uh, the dollars in bank accounts are all created by commercial banks except for the cash in circulation, but it's 100% created by commercial banks. When commercial banks make loans, they are buying your signed note and crediting your account. That's a new deposit that didn't exist before. So in that sense, it's bank loans, bank lending that creates bank deposits. And those deposits can be used to pay taxes because banks are agents of Congress through the Federal Reserve Act. I used to own a bank. I know how much we were an agent of Congress. <laughs> they had regulators breathing down our neck continuously. You know, they regulate our capital, our assets, what we can make loans, what we can't make loans. Uh, it's called CAMEL, C-A-M-E-L-S. Our management, they don't like my president. I have to fire the guy. Uh, earnings, liquidity, every, everything is under, you know, direct uh, capital adequacy, you name it. It's all under direct control of Congress. So uh, I consider banks as agents of Congress, much like the military platoon would be an ag agent of Congress. Okay. So can I? So yes, that? yes, that, that's where most of the balance is. Okay. That so people I'm glad you said from. that. I'm, a, I'm yeah. glad you said that, and I know you, that you are aware of that. Um, but when banks create loans, like yeah. even though they're they're regulated, yeah. banks create loans for their own profit. That's the prime motivation. When you right, right, but they they have to do it within a very narrow scope set by the uh, regulators, and no, the regulators come in. Yeah, I mean, I was there. The regulators would look at a loan and say, look, this doesn't qualify under our guidelines. You know, you have to take a haircut against your capital. It doesn't count. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you do have those restrictions. 
Yes. But you don't go in uh, in a session where you're providing a loan and think, well, how can I benefit the government? Correct. When I create, when I create this loan. My yeah, you just motive, say, right. My prime motive right. is profit, correct? Right, correct. Right. So this is kind of a, talk, a common talking point uh, amongst MMTers is that they Well, say, look, Jeff, Jeff, don't forget the banks compete with each other. So, you know, so they're yeah. all- the banks compete with each other for the loans. No, I totally agree. Uh, right, I totally right, right, understand right. it. But they're competing right. against each other for, yes. a, profit, yeah. for a profit. Yes, 100%. Not, not, 100%. not to benefit the, the government in any way whatsoever. Exactly. I agree. Okay. That's good. So my one of my main points and my objections, because I'm very familiar with the deficit myth. Yeah. And also I've read your book, Soft Currency Economics, too. Okay. Good. So when you conflate, like... By omission, because you don't mention this, that the majority of digital money circulation is created, you know, by commercial banks with a profit motive, yeah. then it makes the assumption. The only thing that uh, like a newborn reader would say or think when they read that is that the government creates all the currency in existence. And you conflate currency, yeah. which is actually banknotes, according to all central banks, that's how they define it. As yeah. banknotes, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't use that narrow definition. I just say the dollar, the yen, the mark, the things that you know that the government designates that can be used for payment of taxes. Okay, when I talk about but, the but this all this all fits in to yeah. your stab hypothesis, right? And the central bankers the use the central bankers got their definition from convertible currency. Those were those were the things that could be converted to gold. So it was well, reserves right. plus currency. It was base money, yeah, his, and that's not a, that's not applicable anymore. Yeah, yeah, that that's historically accurate. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. But that is a definition used by all central banks right now. Is okay. Uh, currency is banknotes. Yeah. So when you say that, and actually the quotes from Stephanie Kelton's book, yeah, that's what she's talking about. She's yeah. talking about the right of the central bank, the sole right, to be the monopoly the monopoly issuer of currency, but that does yeah. not include the majority of digital money in circulation. Okay, okay. so I, I, if I had, if I, you know, I'm not sure that when I, I worked with Randy on his 1998 book, and I, I think that one is, will be technically correct on everything where the money is, a, is defined as a thing that twin to puck, he called it, that which can be used to pay taxes. And I think Stephanie, I, I haven't finished her book, but I think she's got it in there, it's the, the thing that can be used to pay taxes. Now, maybe later on, you know, the word currency is used in that way, and I would not do that. Okay, that's that's good to hear. So, yeah. but in Kelton's book, there's yeah. a quote where she says that, yeah. you know, <laughs> she says she says exactly that that it's yeah. that federal th federal taxes don't pay for anything. Yeah. So, now, do, you, um, do you agree that federal taxes don't pay for anything? Well, again, that's ambiguous language. I, what I say is the federal government is not revenue constrained, okay, when they spend. Federal spending is not constrained by tax revenues. Now, that is not to say that the Treasury is not constrained, okay, they are. The Treasury is politically constrained from spending by tax revenues or borrowing. But the federal government is not, and the federal government includes the Fed. So what they've done is they've set up two agencies, they constrained one, and not indirectly, not the other. So what the Fed can do is spend without taxing, spend first. They can do repos. They can you know, buy the collateralized well, notes of the primary <laughs> dealers to provide the funds that the Treasury can then borrow, right? Okay, well, and this so, is kind of refreshing for me. Yeah, uh, so the government as a whole is not constrained, but they, a lot of well, agencies but, are constrained. But, but this, again, this, this goes yeah. back into the stab hypothesis about the government spending first. So yes, once, yes. The once the government de decides that it's going to spend through yes. Congress, right? Yeah. Through, through the budget committee, yeah. then the actual mechanical process goes into effect. Yes. So the only other way that the government can raise money outside of taxes and revenue. Not the government, the treasury. Is, is to issue not, securities, correct? No, no, not the government, the treasury. Yes, but for the government, the only way that the government can well, the Federal Reserve money. is part of the government. The Federal Reserve is part of the government, right? And they don't they don't raise money or not raise money. They don't have dollars or not have dollars. They just credit accounts and debit accounts. 
you yeah. know, so so when you, if you include the Federal Reserve, they can spend first by crediting an account. Okay, there's. And in there's fact, no they evidence. do. They do. They do. They do spend first by crediting an account. Yeah, there's no evidence though that they credit the accounts first. Like if you look. Oh, sure, sure, there is. No, no. Okay, show me if you can provide a link for that. Because if you look yeah. at the daily or the monthly treasury statements, yeah, it shows how it works. That's why they have the operating cash. Yeah, but you you, you have to remember that you have to remember an, an overdraft in an account is spending by the Fed. It's a loan. It's an overdraft loan. It's a Fed purchase of that promissory that promised to pay. And it's, okay. they grant overdrafts. So that it's a line of credit. And that is that is technically or operationally Fed spending. An overdraft is the same as a loan, which okay, is okay, but the, th the which thing is, is a subset of no spending. Yes, there is no wholesale overdraft capacity. That's that's why the operating by who? Wait, say that again. Exists. Who who doesn't have an overdraft capacity? An overall overdraft for, capacity for who? For who? For anybody. So when you, you look when you look at the treasury statement, the, well, the Fed the doesn't have the Fed doesn't have overdrafts. They just credit an account, and then their capital goes negative. So that would be an overdraft. The Fed the Fed can run negative capital. They have an open ended ability to run negative capital. Okay. If you look at the monthly or daily treasury yeah. statement, sure. it clearly shows inflows, outflows, and the operating cash balance always has to be positive before the government can spend. Before the treasury can spend, not the, the government. Okay. Yeah, but, but the, the Fed the has treasury, the, the treasury pays the government. The, the, no, no, there is no the government. There's the Treasury, there's the Fed, there's Congress. Okay, look, the, the, the Fed has already spent when Treasury sell, gets paid for its securities. The money the Treasury gets comes from the Fed. Yeah, that's where I totally disagree, and there's no evidence. Okay, well, I can, look, I look at the primary dealer setup. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so they've, you know, the... the uh, Dealers, uh, you know, borrow the money from the Fed through repos to pay that, that pays the treasury. So is, I, I was I was is, a primary dealer for like two years at Bankers Trust. I watched these guys do this stuff. Is it yeah, okay well, if we make yeah. this into a private conversation okay. yeah, so sure, that sure. we can get to other people's questions? Sure. I, I don't All mean right. to be rude, Jeff. Let, let's do that, and then we can come back to this at the end if there's still time. Yeah, okay. no, I would love Absolutely. to continue this with you, Warren. Okay. Some of the but we can, we can do this privately questions. anytime. But I, I, I really, if you go to any central banker, they say, look, we can't do a reserve drain without a prior reserve ad. So we already know the government spends first. You know, let's talk about something else. I don't even talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. We can talk about it later. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Warren is lovely with his time, I must say. Thank you, Warren. And he yeah. will he'll definitely discuss this with you in detail, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so Ganesh has a question. Can you unmute Ganesh? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks, Ramona. Hello. Thanks, Warren. Um, the question that I had, uh, which you may have addressed earlier, probably one of the first questions, but I'm going to kind of come back to it. Uh, so as I work with state assembly and Senate candidates, so state candidates on their campaigns, if I could influence their policy platforms, how could I get them to insert MMT into their policy platform when they're running for state office? Is that even possible? You know, unless one of the things you're talking about is what they will do to work with your people in Washington to get the state the funding that it needs from the federal level. So if they're going to be working with people in Washington, then they can work it into that, you know, and they'll have proposals for Congress that they want to then work with your representatives, you know, to get done. So I think that's the avenue for that type of thing. So it's it's basically the they have to work with Congress to get funding for whatever programs that they want to implement. Because uh, the struggle they have with yeah. is they are constantly trying to move money from one program to another within their budget. But yeah, it's impossible. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's impossible, and uh, and they're forced to be pro cyclical, which means when things slow down, they're forced to cut back things that Congress can, you know, um, offset. And, but you have to be able to work closely with Congress and the states should be working closely with Congress on these kinds of matters. And so they could say, look, my opponent isn't going to be working with Congress on these matters. I am, this is what we need as a state to survive, you know, in this union. Okay. Um, 
I think that the, the sort of follow up to that is that I, I hear a lot of like Congress isn't doing anything. We have to try to solve our own problems here. Is that essentially yeah. an impossible game? Uh, for the most part, yeah. I mean, there okay. could be some things. I can't make a general statement, but I'd say, you know, I, I think so. Yeah, I think for the most part, it's, it's got a, the, the big problems we're talking about is federal. Now, there are things you can do that can solve your problem and push it to another state, right? There are these mm -hmm. major races to the bottom that you right. have to work with Congress to stop. Like, you need, we need unified corporate tax laws, state tax laws, so the states don't compete with each other for, you know, whoever has the lowest taxes and the worst education can attract the next Amazon factory, you know, warehouse. And so if everybody had to give the same taxes, you know, uh, considerations to Amazon, then you wouldn't have that kind of race to the bottom competition that's, you know, gutting everything. So we've got to get rid of those. And they have to work with their congressmen to do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Alex Nisbet. Can you please unmute, Alex? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, so people often, particularly politicians and in the news and whatnot, they equate the economy with GDP. And I've heard a variety of criticisms of this, first from Mariana Matsukato, um, and her criticism is basically that GDP includes the fire sector since the 70s or 80s, and this shouldn't be part of GDP. And from Michael Hudson, he has an even stronger critique. And I've, I've heard some criticisms from you on using you know, GDP statistics, um, in part would be, from, from what I've heard from you, would be you know, uh, tax compliance costs, right? I mean, these, these people, they're basically doing useless work and it gets added to GDP. <laughs> um, and so I was wondering if, if you might be able to elaborate on this, um, um, whether you think, to what degree you think GDP statistics are useful or whether there's a, another statistic that's useful to look at. And this is just something that's been bothering me a lot, particularly since reading Michael Hudson's yeah. criticism. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, thank you. You know, they're, they're, they have their place. They're useful for comparisons, but... Um, when you look at the detail, probably two thirds of the economy is, you know, people digging holes and people filling them in or worse. The financial sector is almost entirely parasitic, at least 95%, which is mainly the fire sector, but there's more to it than that. You know, Medicare for all would save 500 billion a year, 5 million jobs would be lost and redeployed to something useful rather than doing advertising and marketing for insurance companies that doesn't have to be done. And I, you know, I can go through, you know, going to a permanent zero rate policy gets rid of all those bond traders. I have proposals for the stock market that gets cuts that casino down from by ninety percent and still uh, facilitates real investment the way we want it to. And so, this is like critical, critical, critical for the Green New Deal and saving the planet because what we need is people to do things. You know, it's not about creating jobs. There are, there are more green jobs that need to be done than there are people that do them. And so we've got to get them from somewhere. And we could probably redeploy two thirds of our jobs without losing anything useful in the areas like I just talked about. Right. Uh, and, and so, um, and that's in real terms has to be done. And then we can show you how to do it in monetary terms because all those sectors that they talk about are supported by some government policy, some legislation that causes all this stuff to happen. One of the deadly innocent frauds is that we need savings to have money for investment. So we have all these savings incentives. You put money in your pension fund, you don't have to pay taxes on it until you take it out 50 years from mm -hmm. now. And so that creates these huge pools of money that we have all these money managers operating. Then Wall Street hires the best to feed off the rest, which is all our pension funds. And we get these enormous disparities of income and things that you know don't exist in nature but exist under this institutional structure we've set up uh kind of like a lottery right so um uh i don't know answering your question but well, we're looking at public, a, um, yeah if we're looking at public purpose like how to make how to do the green new deal the gdp numbers aren't, aren't particularly helpful yeah but if, yeah but if we're looking for what's the potential 
tax base if we're trying to tax income, well, then it's helpful. But uh, I don't really need that information anyway. Right. So, yeah, well, you you, yeah. you propose taxing land instead of income anyway, so well, <laughs> property tax, yeah, property, property tax. tax. Well, yeah. so, so if I could do a small follow up, I, I so yeah. polit- politically, um, I, I sort of imagine, you know, I agree with the point about the GDP, and you know, you, if you want to yeah. do and um, you know, save the environment, you, the conservation, you mean that kind of yeah. fits quite in with the GDP argument. But I can imagine politically, once this stuff becomes a little bit more mainstream, because I, I think the logic on this is right. You know, you're gonna. There's going to be a, a political fight where people say, "Well, yeah, we could do these policies, but look at what will happen to GDP if we do this. GDP will cut in half, and that's terrible yeah. for the economy." And it's obviously kind of nonsense, but politically, yeah. that just sounds like it's going to be a big slog. Well, <laughs> well, G- GDP <laughs> is it, GDP is income, right? So sales and income, same thing. Yeah. To the to the penny, right? Somebody's sales is uh, is somebody's income. Purchase, someone's purchase is someone's income. So w- when we do a Green New Deal, we're not going to reduce total income. So we're not going to reduce GDP. It's going, the composition is going to change dramatically, but it's not going to get reduced. We're going to have more people working, you know, with similar pay, let's say in real terms, just for a number. And so GDP is going to go up. Mm-hmm. But say, um, so with the Green Green New Deal, where it's investment based, but what you're saying about um, conservation, say, you know, yeah. say you just tell 30% of people what you do is, a waste of time, just stay home and we'll get rid of the taxes so people won't need the tax compliance. Yeah. Um, you know, that I think on the official statistics, that would drop GDP, even though there's no real well, change no, in, in wealth. We need, we've, if, we, if we do that to 30 million people, we're going to need 40 million to do what we need to do for the Green New Deal to do what's possible. We're going to need more. You know, we can always use more people in education, medical research, university professors. How many research assistants would they like? How about right. performance where people can go watch performances? What, how many, how much more of that can you do? How many people can you tie up in, you know, that sector? It's like unlimited how right. software. How much software can you write? That's, that's all paid work that will show up as GDP, you know, if it's done properly. So it's, it's just a measurement. It's, there's no reason to think that we'd have fewer people working at the end of the day. I, I've got every reason to think that the participation rate will go up by 10 full points. We'll have that many more people working and, uh, at least maybe 15 because they don't want to work because it's all useful stuff. And because they'll feel like they're part of the team that's doing something important and not just somebody who's stuck with some job they don't like, but, you know, a useful member of what's going on. Not everybody feels that way, of course, you know, Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, but overall it will. It's like, kind of like a war effort. You get a lot more people involved. You have people volunteering for the military during the war who never would have volunteered without a war. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you got the right one, the war that people support. So this is a war that people should support dramatically and they can help by doing their share. And that might be anything from planting trees to assisting somebody, you know, in a medical lab or whatever. Uh, I don't know. So, but there's no limit. To, there's always more to do than there are people to do it. <laughs> right. Okay. That, that makes good sense. Thank, okay. thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so I'm making an executive decision here. Um, Valena has a question. Can you please unmute Valena? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I had a question about using MMT to pay for reparations and um, it's part of the ADOS movement. And um, we've been kind of pushing back on that because we feel as though monetary policy is part of critical race theory. And the way MMT is explained is like with MMT, you, we wouldn't need reparations. So I just wanted to clarify uh, no. the strategy with MMT and reparations exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I've had a little bit of experience recently with this work, you know, talking to people offline uh, in, in groups. Number one, what you don't like, again, you don't use MMT. But if you understand the monetary system, you realize that right now, the government could write a check for $5 trillion or whatever it wants, that check will not bounce. And they don't need the Fed to buy securities, they don't need anything, just in the normal, you know, spend the money and 
some gets used to pay taxes and the rest winds up buying securities through the primary dealer system. There's no limit right now to the number of dollars the government can spend. If that spending translates into spending on goods and services, it could drive up prices, which people would call inflation. Okay, now if they just download more songs from Apple or something like that, you're not, there's no limit to how many songs they can download. Then it's whether or not Apple spends the money that they got to drive up prices. So there's a whole like demand filter you go through to, you know, to, it's not gonna be a one-to-one -one spending to drive up prices. So, and I can't tell you, you need some econometric place to tell you what that may or may not do to the price level. But you don't have to worry about the government going broke. It won't drive up interest rates. Rates won't go up unless the Fed raises them and they've got it backwards. They should never raise them. They should leave them at zero. And uh, so that's, so we take solvency off the table. So now there's other things. And to me, my question to the groups I've spoken to is like, what is your goal? What do you want to happen? Uh, and I get a variety of answers. So there's no one focus on that. So I can't give you one policy to meet the goal because it seems to be several. So some want a level playing field for everybody and some want um, a head start because of, to make up for past wrongs, you know, and some want, uh, uh, you know, di different things like that. So if you give me any one of those, I can, come up with a policy that can get you from here to there. And the next thing you got to look at is who is going to pay for it in real terms. And this is absolutely critical because if, if, if you get cash payments of reparations and that money is spent on goods and services and the GDP stays the same, let's say, some, somebody else is going to have less for somebody to have more apart from the normal growth in the economy that can be accommodated. And if you're at full employment, there really, really isn't any except productivity growth. So if you're gonna get a 15% jump or something in GDP, um, you know, demand, who's gonna have less? And invariably it winds up being, you know, the guy making, you know, $40,000 a year trying to take care of his family, he's gonna to have to cut back on something and his spend, his money won't buy as much or he won't get as much in terms of real goods and services. Whereas the billionaires are gonna, you know, they might have less money in their bank account, but they're gonna be eating the same food and flying on the same private planes. They're not gonna give anything up in real terms. So the question is who pays for it in real terms and how? This first came up with Greek reparations. They wanted reparations from Germany back in the Greek crisis. And I pointed out like, who's gonna pay for these? I say, I'll tell you who's gonna pay for it. It's gonna be the Polish worker at the BMW or the Mercedes factory who winds up you know, with less compensation for his time at the factory. It's not gonna be the Krups or any of the industrialists who made money off of World War II. It's just, that's not how Germany is set up right now. That's not who's gonna, in real terms, pay for this. So you've got my email. I'm happy to go into it in more detail with you. I have a question, Warren. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Felina. Go ahead. I wasn't sure. Um, okay. Um, when it comes to uh, the actual history of our monetary policy, it's, it's, it's part of critical race theory that Abraham Lincoln wasn't killed because he ended slavery. He was killed because of the greenback. And that's part of our critical race push. So you're telling me that it's not about that. It's about who's going to pay for it later. Well, you know, maybe I'll get killed because somebody thinks, you know, because I'm telling people that, you know, the government could just write a check for five trillion and it's not going to bounce. And so you don't have that excuse for not doing it. And maybe like Lincoln, somebody's going to kill me, but I'm not. All I can tell you is that check's not going to bounce and that the government is fully capable of writing any check they want. It won't bounce. It might cause some inflation. But does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can I do a follow-up question on that, Warren? Yeah. So if the federal government is able to pay reparations, right? And yes. uh, is there a way that we can have reparations as part of a policy and not have it cause inflation? Because I know that it's, it's the same issue with UBI. Yeah. 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 So yes, there are ways. For example, you can limit how much of it can be spent over time and things like that. You can spread it out and uh, to minimize things. You can, uh, 
or like baby oh. bonds. Yeah, was another thing, but that doesn't really adjust yeah, that's, for that's now. A, that, that, yeah, that's another way to spread out the spending over time. You know, there's only, you know, given the assumption that there's a, so much real goods and services produced, which isn't correct. It's it's got elastic, but given that it's fixed, just point of argument, then you're going to be redirecting some of the output from, you know, redistributing that out, the real output. And if we're going to grow at 3% anyway, and you're going to, you want to redirect that 3% growth and leave everybody else the same, you can do that. But, you know, it's, it's a, it's a distributional question uh, when you're making distributional things and, and not that it should be done. I'm just trying to give you like what's going to happen and why. And, uh, uh, now, you know, if you do things like go to Medicare for all, then that frees up a lot. And that is if you did that in conjunction with reparations as an offset, then there wouldn't be any loss to anybody. But if you did Medicare for all without reparations, then everybody else would benefit from the 500 billion a year savings in Medicare for all. So even if you come up with things, those things could have been used to everyone's benefit anyway. They could be done whether you're doing reparations or not. And so like if we eliminate uh, the income tax, that's 15% of GDP. It's you know, 5 trillion a year or something. It's huge. And if we eliminate the financial sector, it's probably another 15% of GDP. So you're up to 10 trillion a year that's available. Well, that's available to everybody if we don't do reparations. If we do reparations, some of it is that, that increased real output is increased real consumption is going in that direction. And that might be the equitable thing to do. I'm not here to argue, you know, dollar for dollar what is social equity, you know, in this call. I can do that separately, but I'm just trying to give you the framework for your analysis. Okay, thank you. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Timothy has a question. Can you unmute Timothy? Okay, maybe Timothy is not here, and I will ask Timothy's question. He's, he, he's oh, here. He's Timothy, here. can you unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, um, thanks for this. It's been um, a good opportunity. Now, I have a question about um, the idea of a steady state economy and how MMT may be able to accomplish that, um, how that would look. Um, the, the idea is is there any way to get a, beyond a consumption-based economy with the with how um, the idea of MMT is used? Okay, so uh, we have a lot of things in our economy today that have a, a zero cost of production, zero marginal cost, and they're infinitely expandable, like downloading songs, as I mentioned before. And that counts as GDP growth. So would you say we want to eliminate that because it's GDP growth? No. So, you know, if, what we're trying to do is shift the composition of GDP, I think, as it's currently defined, with the composition of growth as it's currently defined. And we can shift it to things that don't consume, you know, resources that we don't want consumed and don't pr produce emissions that we don't want produced and still have a lot of things, you know, more and more things, but not those things. And that's not difficult. It just takes political will and it takes a the serious discussion and it takes a full understanding of monetary operations so we don't leave critical policy options off the table as we do now uh, because congress doesn't understand monetary operations they leave all these options to do what i just said off the table this reminds me of uh brought to mind the life of brian unmute timothy <laughs> 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 Might have done it on purpose. Hey, yeah. Thanks, thanks for your response. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Cheryl has a question. Okay, I'll read a question. Oh, please read. Yes. Um, <laughs> have you read the HR ninety one nine seven six text? Jay Paul introduced M four A legislation. 
why do we draft this legislation using language that emphasizes cost containment instead of mission-based language that would ensure the American people receive quality patient care? I'm one of those high cost patients as it, as it calls me, who sees myself and my peers suffering harm from the cost cutting being imposed and in inadequacies of our current system. Why do we limit why do we limit its funding to previous year's amounts when we know that our healthcare system is currently underfunded and has been for decades? How do we educate progressives, even those who understand MMT, to come around to support legislation that is more inclusive for populations who most desperately need health services? Well, I th you know, I think I'm already trying to do that with everything I have. I'm full support of free Medicare for all. And I've shown that it's deflationary. You don't need to have a tax to go with it. If anything, it will support other spending programs. Uh, and it helps bring down inflation because it eliminates healthcare as a cost for businesses. So the costs are lower, the extent that they're competitive, the lower prices. If they're not competitive, they should be regulated anyway, which would mean lower prices because of lower costs. Uh, and it frees up 5 million people, $500 billion a year, uh, to do other things like be real healthcare workers instead of advertising and marketing people in uh, private insurance companies. And so, yeah, we've got, I've certainly got lots of proposals that uh, lots of people agree with, but not nearly enough. And the um, challenge has been getting it up to the level of policy. And I can't give Stephanie Kelton enough credit for having got it as far as it has gotten. And uh, she'll be the first to tell you it's got a long way to go, but we're, We've definitely made progress, and, and it, but far too slow, you know, considering how easy this is. It should have been done a long time ago. Okay. Our next question um, is from uh, I don't know who to call, but um, Jonathan. Cadman. Jonathan, can you unmute? Okay, I'll ask his question. Um, I wonder if you might discuss stocks and flows. I feel like people mistakenly think that all government spending is the same when only a small portion ever gets to circulation, circulating among ordinary people or where they might spend it. And much of that is siphoned right back out of the demand pool in a form of rents and debt payments. I feel like that tells an important story, how it circulates and where it goes. Okay, so let me, let me tell you the important part. If the government just hired all the people it wanted to build roads and do everything else directly, they each got paid directly and the manager got paid a salary for being a manager, you'd have a fairly equitable distribution of um, income for that activity. But if he gives the whole thing to one contractor, who keeps 10% for himself and then hires everybody else out at competitive bids and, uh, you know, beats him down as much as he can so he can make maybe 15% for himself. Now you get a very different distribution of income and everything else. So how the government spends and what, you know, it uh, demands from its spending are absolutely critical uh, to, to the entire distribution of income for the whole economy. And add to that all the laws and policies that Congress uses, which puts in place, which I call the institutional structure. And the, what, you, what you realize is that the entire distribution of income is almost 100% in the hands of this institutional structure. So anything you see that looks like some kind of an injustice, it shouldn't be the way it is. You can probably blame the government for it, blame Congress for it because of some law or some institution they've set up that's creating this mess. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when I look at the crash of 08, I see it as a, entirely as a failure of government. And all the agents who, who were 
cited for causing the crash or whatnot, if you trace it back a little, they were acting on government instructions and under government incentives with government funding and government supervision and government regulations. And I had direct experience with the government regulators and I can tell you they were a large part of the problem, uh, the bank regulators at the time and probably continue to be. So uh, I, I wanted to give you a general answer because I can't like specifically go through everything. If you want a little bit more, send me an email, I think and I can get it to you. Okay, great. Um, Christina has a question. Oh, well, thank you. I have to find my question now, but it has to do with if, um, it, what's stopping Congress from closing all private banks now? I mean, uh, or perhaps uh, banks that have uh, basically been proven to manipulate mortgage loans um, leading to the mortgage crisis, the financial crisis of 2008 as well as currently um, involving themselves in um, in discriminatory uh, uh, foreclosure, uh, not, I'm sorry, just uh, um, uh, discriminatory uh, practices when it comes to refinancing loans. Yeah, so, okay, nothing is stopping Congress from doing that. At one point they had Bill Black as a regulator and he like, I don't know, put a thousand people in jail for doing that. So it's entirely up to them whether or not they want to prosecute and and or not. And uh, you know, these are our elected officials making that decision. There's absolutely nothing stopping them. It's entirely in their control under the Federal Reserve Act. The, the regulatory categories are the acronym is CAMELS, C A M E L S, capital assets, and the M is management. They can fire the management anytime they want, penalize them, prosecute them. They have full authority to do that. Thank you. That brings us directly to the argument that MMT Earths make that basically banks are a creature of Congress. Yes. There's no question about it from on a legal basis. That's that's how it was set up. That's why they're there. And that's Chairman Bernanke said, I take my marching orders from Congress. I mean, that's when people ask. Them. Perfect. Um, Kenny has a question. Um, can you unmute Kenny? Hello, hello. You can hear me out there. Yes. Yes. Howdy. Uh, good to speak with you, Warren. Um, yeah, recently heard you on the Activist, uh, Activist MMT podcast, and you guys talked a little bit about income inequality. And um, but generally, so this is definitely not an MMT question, more of like a your personal just thoughts uh, as an economist around how uh, people with massive amounts of, of money have, you know, can affect the economy versus, you know, people that just are, are barely having anything. So even after we put in all the job guarantee and all those other services that bring up the bottom, do you still think that, uh, I generally got the impression that it didn't seem to matter to you that you can have ultra rich people, you know, with uh, billions and trillions of dollars. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you generally not think that there, that could have a negative imbalance in the economy that when you have a, 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 a decent sized portion of people with flying cars and, and uh, you know, castles in the sky versus just the regular, most regular of us that are kind of doing, you know, our normal thing. Yeah. Uh, do, do, you know, do you have a personal opinion on that or, or an economic opinion on that? Maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's like, you know, first of all, I, I'm up for getting, you know, I've proposed a lot of ways to eliminate these disparities at source rather than pay out the money and then try and get it back, which doesn't ever work, but just eliminate it at source, like the zero rate policy, like my equity proposals and uh, eliminating the, uh, you know, switching to a property tax, you know, to eliminate the compliance costs. A lot of these, these things all go a long way, you know, probably get rid of 70% of the problem, not hundred percent, but 70%. But I think there's like an idea of America and that, you know, what is social equity in America? So if you come up with the best, a new can opener and everybody uses it, they love it and you make a billion dollars. I don't think people resent that. I think it's people who make their money doing other things that are not, uh, do not come from goods and services that were built for everyone's benefit or, uh, you know, and so I don't think that as a, I, look, I don't think anybody, not too many people are against the lottery. I've always asked Bernie Sanders supporters, 
Are you against the lottery? You know, you pay, buy a ticket for a dollar and you win a billion dollars, now you're a billionaire. Should you not be allowed? And they, they don't have any answer for that. So, uh, but I think they think that's fair. Everybody gets a chance and one guy gets it. That's sort of okay. So the, the, the population doesn't seem to be categorically against so, People who do better, you know, and do things, nice little gesture, things getting more out of it. Nice little wound there. I don't know what is wrong to whatever. Dr. Paul, you okay. talk to you about it. Um, I'm getting crosstalk here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody is yeah um, that's not me sorry kenny's still here that is not me that's the real progressive uh, account what happened to her today yeah is that you steve grumbine steve you got a mute but, um, unmuted accidentally okay right, yeah sorry go. um maybe maybe i'll put one more note just um yeah yeah, yeah. real quick to help to help the uh, can find that the answer it would be i know you yeah. talk about if if political coercion starts to happen that's where things go south but i guess if let's say we just fix that i know you have, you've, you've shared those ideas in other places if we fix the political coercion thing do you do you then think that uh there's that income inequality or, or just wealth you know inequality it ha poses a problem or, or not um you know depending on how it got there you know if it got there through nepotism or something like that yeah then you know or if it's all inherited and you got these you know, people can't tie their own shoes with trillions of dollars funding all kinds of idiotic programs. It could create a lot of problems. So it, it, um, it, it, I don't want to back off the question, but say it depends. But in general, I don't like the government sponsored sources of this stuff. And I've offered a lot of proposals to eliminate the government sponsored sources of a lot of it, which I think would remove, remove it as a major issue Although for me, it would still be an issue. I think politically, you could remove it mm. as a major issue by getting rid of these government sponsored things. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Bene people benefiting yeah. off of the system totally makes sense. Uh, I guess yeah. maybe well, one last one last go would be in terms of like yeah. the rich hoarding resources, uh, obviously, you know, is there yeah. a concern there? They'll buy up all the food, well, stuff yeah. like that, or, or, you know, stuff like I don't that. Think do you think that works I in, think in people worry about them having all the money. And not having all the food. It's like, you know, this person has enough money where he could solve hunger. So they're worried he didn't get all the food. So no, to, and if you let it out, it would solve hunger. So he's got all the money. And if it was spent, it could solve hunger. So I think it's like not understanding the, the monetary system that's created yeah. that overlap, you know, from money to real things. And it's got it totally confused. And I, you know, the reason I ask is because I think it does help. The it does clarification on this around the policies yeah. that can help uh, actually help folks versus like just attacking rich people. You know, uh, yeah. is 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 something that we could all use help clarifying so that we can get our uh, you know push our agenda forward without without getting a pushback uh, on just you know going after people that are successful. Again, I I don't even they, I don't I don't yeah. want, I don't love people that that you know abuse systems and stuff. But at the same time, we have to you know make our message clear. So thanks for that. Look, the highest paid guy at the university is a football coach. You don't see a lot of pushback on that because, you know, he brings the money in through TV and everything. Now, if you stopped, if you all want, you know, uh, advertising on TV for college games, you wouldn't have any of that, right? So a lot of this is everybody's turned into a soap salesman and they're all, uh, you know, advertising has uh, is responsible for a lot of this stuff, you know, in different ways to advertise. It causes celebrity status to be, you know, paid the amount it has because of what it can sell, right? And so, um, you know, it's a long discussion. We're kind of running out of time, so I'll, I'm happy to oh, discuss good. Thanks. it all, online. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Um, so yeah, we are out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Warren. Okay. Thank you so much, Real Progressives. Um, this has been amazing. Um, and thank you for joining us, Green Party. Um, and we hope that you will follow up. And um, Warren, do you want to um, put into the chat a link to your work so people can follow up on that? Okay. It's MoslerEconomics.com. I'm seeing double now. I don't even know if I printed it right. And my Twitter is at WB Mosler, where 
topical stuff comes out all the time and all these things. And um, I put my email in there already if anybody wants to send anything. I'd really like to see the Green Party do well. The other two parties have disappointed me for a long time. Uh, and, uh, and then when I see the message, I, I get discouraged. But then when I get invited here to see if I can do something to work with it, it's good. I would like nothing more than to be your spokesman if you needed one to when you have to go to the Fed or when you have to deal with people at Treasury or when you need to deal with a panel of economists. Because I've been dealing with these people for a long time at the highest levels and uh, you know they, they don't have a chance except to conceive what, we, what I've been saying here. It, you know, so that's how you're gonna win these arguments. And uh, I don't know what the path from here to there is, but I, I'd be happy to do it, whatever it takes. I think it's just, um, uh, Warren, we, we can't see your whole face. Oh. Um, <laughs> sorry. I think it's just really at people um, understanding and then doing the reading and asking the questions and the back and forth. And that's really how we all learn because okay. the, the more we read and understand, the more questions we have. <laughs> And yep. then we have to have those those questions answered. Um, and I think uh, something really great that um, I did with Real Progressives is um, the book club. Um, I did uh, a book club for every chapter of the deficit myth. Um, and you could find that on uh, realprogressives.org. Um, and and Warren, all of Warren's work is free. So you can access it and read it and, and contact us and, and ask questions. Um, and you have Warren's email address now, so you can directly ask him. And thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Have a, have a good night. Warren.